Yes. Uh, did you ask me a question? To us, it's no one else. Us, it's no one else. It's always up to us. What do we need to do? Next? What do we need to do next? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another very interesting session of AfroLink Expert Life. I'm happy to be welcoming Guido Schwartz, uh, sitting in Bremen, and Debola Ajayi from Nigeria. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, everyone. So Um, I will start with uh, Guido. Guido, you um, give us a brief introduction of yourself, what you're doing, what brought you into the African ecosystem, into the African economy. Yeah, I'm roughly having a history on the continent next year of 25 years. So um, the first time in my life I went to Johannesburg, that was back in 1996. Uh, ever since I returned regularly, I think almost three to four times per year. Uh, going to South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Namibia, Botswana, other countries in the region. Um, at the moment, I'm a director of the Foundation for Space Festival, regard, in particular in the field of new space, what means at the end of the day the commercialization of space activities. Additionally to this, I'm trying to really uh, put a focus on uh, STEM activities for children so that we can see the next generation of space enthusiasts coming up. I'm, I studied um, uh, different functions and in different areas uh, during my career. Um, I work for a big aerospace company uh, doing business development in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa for a while. was also doing uh, mentoring and uh, coaching activities in Southern Africa, as well as uh, had the pleasure to launch one of the first uh, aerospace uh, startup calls ever on the continent. That was like three or four years ago, which was extremely exciting. It was a quite interesting uh, thing. And uh, the, the enthusiasm and the, the, the spirit and energy that was actually developing through this call and uh, within the startups and entrepreneurs was quite amazing. So um, it had quite some multiplier effects. And I'm very glad to be with you today. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Uh, Debola, what is, what is your story? Who is Debola? a little bit about uh, you. Uh, I, I, I will categorize my story as an entrepreneurial one. I mean, my relationship with Africa is quite simple. I, I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. And I've lived in Lagos, Nigeria all my life. So I'm an African by virtue of birth. You know, I, I live in Nigeria, so this is where I am. Uh, but specifically within the, the country, my journey has been entrepreneurial in nature. I got very interested in entrepreneurship from a very early age. Right out of school, uh, I got into entrepreneurship. I, I didn't uh, go the traditional route of getting out of school and then getting a formal nine to five job. I, in short, I think before I even got out of school, I started my practice you know, as an entrepreneur, helping. And I discovered very early that my passion uh, resided with helping businesses grow. Because uh, I majored in economics in my university days, and I think that um, that helps me to see the e effects and impacts that economic um, indices and outlook has on every nation and every groups of people. And I think it's the foundation of the interest that I developed in the concept of entrepreneurship. So from very early, I've been very passionate about helping businesses grow, helping businesses su succeed, and and uh, helping businesses become, you know, all that they possibly. So yeah, in, in a nutshell, that's what my journey has been like, you know, how I got into a lot of what I'm doing today. That's uh, a very, very interesting journey. 
both of you have a very interesting portfolio. I know both of you, for, for instance, I know your bios. Um, Guido, you, are, you have a huge portfolio. And how can you explain more on the different positions that you hold within the roles you play? And how do you manage it? Like, how do you manage to having so much, uh, so many different positions? Okay, let's say there was in the last 10, 15 years, a lot of changes in the global economy as well as in the industries that I worked in. So I had the pleasure many years ago to start in a, a first in the chemical and then in the renewable energy sector, which gave me a lot of insights and, and totally different activities. Later on, I moved into automotive and logistics and then ended up somehow in aerospace, which was actually a good choice. Um, I don't regret it at all. So um, it is, let's say, energy consumption or consuming. It is energy consuming. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives a lot of uh, activities back, a lot of energy back as well. And um, I had a pleasure to work with very interesting people on interesting projects, I must admit. Um, but I'm always very very surprised and impressed in particular when I'm going uh, into African countries and see, let's say, the, the entrepreneurial spirit that exists and how you can make out of very small things, uh, big changes for the community, uh, how you can really create an impact at the end of the day. Uh, while I'm looking into Europe or the US and, you know, we have all those fundings uh, available. We have a lot of infrastructure that is actually empowering our activities. But um, we only make, my, let's say, minor steps. And um, it, is, it is very interesting to see uh, how you can actually find ways to merge those both ends, let's say, of the chain. So in my role currently as a director of the Foundation for Space Development, I'm even trying to see how can we bring Europe and Africa closer together, but in a, in a pure win-win situation so that both sides benefit and that both sides have an economical, a physical, a social, as well as a, a sustainable development in every mean. Because I think um, there is quite some, some changes taking place right now in these days. If I'm looking at the geostrategic activities that are running on a global scale, uh, we have to see, it seems at the moment, how we want to live in the next 20 to 30 years. It will all depend on the choices that we're taking in respect to what sides side to be somehow belonging which is quite interesting because it brings me back in history to the side of, uh, to the time of the cold war where there was the one side or the other and i actually never expected that this would come back but at the moment i think everyone has somehow to see uh what is the um, the right direction for a country for a nation or for a country for a continent or even a bigger uh, region That's that's a very interesting approach, Debola. You yourself, uh, I think both of you have have a lot and a huge portfolio, which is very interesting. Um, how do you how do you ex manage all of these positions that you're holding currently? Uh, uh, personal management strategy with the different engagements that I have uh, have a lot to do with having the right team of people to work with and ensuring that uh, I have an adequate structure that helps me to maximize my time and to deliver on the several engagements that I have. So I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm careful to ensure that my, my commitments are properly measured right because primarily what i do is i consult for organizations both in the business and social impact sector and then i have both local and international organizations that i partner with and that i work with as a fellow and as an advocate and so basically for everything that we have to do i ensure that our tasks are properly measured and my commitments are within what i can do you know i'm usually careful to not overshoot uh, uh, you know, beyond my capacity in delivering on client expectations. And sometimes I have to say no. I mean, that's a major part of how I manage everything that I do. Uh, being able to say no and saying, I'm sorry, I will not be able to get involved in that because uh, sometimes people approach me to try to get me involved in one project or the other, but I'm careful to ensure that I do not go beyond what I can manage part-time. 
right? So yeah, I, I just ensure that I have the right team part-time and that my structural processes are manageable and always in place. So that, that's how I do it. Very, very impressive. Uh, Guido, you mentioned it before that you're the director of the Foundation for Space and Development in Africa. Um, what does your role entail and is there an interest from young Africans in an issue related to space? There is indeed. Um, so the role is entailing at the end of the day uh, to bring more attention actually to the space sector in Africa, which is existing, which has actually even quite some history what many people don't know. Already back in the 70s, there were launches um, leaving the African soil uh, from Kenya into space. Uh, so Africa had, had similar ambitions and uh, actually managed it then in the 80s and uh, came up with rockets which have been state of the art at that time um, together with satellite technology. So they developed their own satellites uh, to bring them into space on the communication and earth observation side. So we're trying actually to uh, create more awareness for this, also to interest um, kids obviously into this, as I said earlier, the next generation of enthusiasts for space, to really motivate them to do to, to do uh, STEM-related studies in their uh, academic career and then look into those in the, into this sector and try actually to, to build up um, yeah, the next, the next relevant industry on the continent. Because everyone speaks about Industry 4.0, but at the end of the day, we can only make it happening uh, with uh, space technology because there is no fiber cables actually going through the continent, all of them actually getting around. So we have to look for new solutions. And we need a lot of bright, interested people, people with an entrepreneurial spirit and people who really want to make a difference. And if I see one thing all the time, if I'm on the continent, that there's in particular the younger generation who's extremely looking into this and who want to do this for change. And they think that tech is exactly the right approach for it. That is very great, actually. I didn't know that that there was uh, so much going on with aerospace on the African continent. So thank you for uh, always also bringing new things in. Uh, Debola, you're also the co-founder of, I hope I say it right, Kuvasa Africa. Um, uh, it's a non-profit organization, a non-governmental organization, as I know. Um, what does yeah. this NGO tell us about a bit about uh, what do you do and tell us a little bit about the recently completed global leaders training that you guys hosted yeah so Kowaza is the, the word means ignite in Swahili uh, Swahili is one of the languages that is spoken in Africa all right so we called it so basically Kowaza means ignite Africa Right, and as the name implies, uh, myself and my co-founder, our passion and our desire is to empower and enable other young Africans make the best out of the resources available to them, you know, part time. In our travels around Africa, in my conversation and in my, you know, interaction with other young people from all over Africa. One major thing that I kept, you know, coming across from Nairobi to South Africa, to Morocco, to Zimbabwe, to Botswana, to Ghana, to Nigeria, is that Africans are passionate. Uh, Africans are a group of individuals who are passionately proactive. Uh, Africans aren't, uh, um, we are not, we're not docile. Africans have driven their go-getters and as i kept um, my co-founder and i as we kept experiencing this across several countries in the continent we decided that you know it would be a good initiative to create a platform that young people can come on board can come to express their dreams their goals find other individuals to connect with share resources with you know share ideas with and therefore multiply their impact and their effect. So recently, uh, we launched our first cohort of our Global Leaders Program, uh, where we worked with 30 participants from over 12 different countries in Africa. And it was a great time. We spent about uh, nine 
nine to 12 weeks with these 30 individuals with weekly online virtual, with weekly virtual calls. And for me, one of the most interesting things about these particular cohort was the fact that despite the fact that it was in the midst, the very middle of the lockdown, we were able to group all 30 uh, individuals into teams of five and you know, encourage them to launch a social impact focused program in this time. And all five teams were able to successfully come up with social impact initiatives, launch their initiatives virtually, get people to attend their virtual conferences and seminars and effectively pass across their message. So it was amazing. That was amazing for us. And the testimonials, you know, the responses were, were, were really good. Um, we had individuals who had never organized anything before, you know, people who basically had just been passionate about one thing or the other. And all they needed was this platform with other young people, you know, to come together to collaborate and to create something, um, something phenomenal, something impactful. And so for me, that's what Cosa is about. We're simply building a platform where we're saying that, look, we want other young people from all over Africa to come together to share resources, to share knowledge, you know, to share the conversation and to keep moving, keep going forward and keep impacting our communities everywhere we are. So really that's our vision for Kuwaza Africa. And that's exactly how it should be, right? Yes. <laughs> As, uh, <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Thank you. So, so we have, uh, for today, we have the topic, the future is now, what impact are you making? Um, we have chosen this theme also to be for this year's conference, uh, which, we will, uh, which will take place on the 25th of September. Guido, I know you have been a very frequent visitor during our conferences in Berlin. Um, so my question goes to you, going in with the theme, what impact are you making? So on, on the one side, I'm trying to be somehow an inspiration for certain topics, you know, topics that people haven't thought about before, like space. So I had a pleasure at the last um, Afrolink conference in Berlin um, to moderate actually a workshop or execute a workshop, not just moderate, but execute a workshop about uh, a potential IoT small site constellation for Africa. Just to see what is the what could be the interest um, on the African side, as well as on the European side, to see how can funding may be made available for a project like this? How can be jobs created through this? How can be innovation part of it and uh, put forward? Uh, additionally to this, as I said, I'm almost I would say five, six, maybe seven years I'm mentoring our African startups, which is extremely exciting. I'm learning a lot about it. And um, I'm trying to give the, a, a different perspective to the African startups in particular if they want to scale up their products. If they can be a bit more focused, uh, first of all, on the African needs and the African solutions for that, instead of just going, for instance, to the United States or to Israel or to China, uh, to put a certain product in place there. Obviously, there is the funding uh, uh, but, uh, I think everyone will agree that the market to uh, see where they can further get additional support and actually also look into potential corporations so that they are not uh, steady, but that they have also some, some people who are exactly developing into the same direction and who would appreciate uh, having some, some yeah, let's say, positive, uh, bigger relationships to really develop the products and services that they have in mind. And that could even then be quicker scaled up for more markets, but also, um, yeah, serving the original needs that exist today and that will exist in the future in Africa. That is very, very interesting. Um, you're making an impact. I think uh, we, we are sure, and also Guido, you're making a huge impact. 
Um, my question is, how can you relate to the theme, Deborah, regarding the future is now, what impact are you making? Um, so I, I think for me, uh, looking back to three months ago now, when the COVID-19 situation, when it hit fully in Nigeria, uh, this was around towards the end of the month of March. That's when we had a massive, that's when uh, 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 the reality came into our country and the lockdowns began to be initiated by several state governments and then eventually by the federal government. You know, this began around towards the end of March and then fully in the month of April and May, totally locked down and then we came into the curfew and all that. Now, during the lockdown, uh, I realized that I had a choice, you know, sit and do nothing or see how I could um, um, pivot, you know, how I could respond innovatively to the challenge that was on ground. So there are two things that happened. Uh, one is amongst the several things I do, I manage a nonprofit organization. Now, not mine, mm -hmm. not Kwasi Africa, uh, a nonprofit organization, an international one that has partnerships with uh, organizations like Save the Children International and partnerships with the Royal Commonwealth Society. And we launched, you know, um, a COVID-19 relief initiative to both the state and federal government in Nigeria. And so, you know, because I'm the manager of this nonprofit, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one responsible to come up with and execute initiatives. I couldn't just sit at home. You know, so for me, I got on the field, um, we procured um, PPE materials for frontline health workers. And, you know, we had to go there. We had to make these deliveries. We had to see what was happening on the front lines. You know, so for me, beyond the fact that I, I got on the field, it also was, it, it, I, I think it further brought home the fact, and even though many people are at home and sheltering in, there are people, people who had to be on the front lines, you know, there were people who had to put their lives at risk for the sake of everybody else. And so for me, uh, it, it, it further reinforced and brought home how that service, you know, to humanity must be at the backbone of everything that we do, including our business pursuits and enterprises. And really, when service to humanity becomes the foundation or the backbone of innovation, then you will continually see positive advancements, you know, and forward thinking uh, progress happening for civilization. So this, this is one major thing that happened to me. Another was I launched a free coaching program for individuals on my platform uh, because in the first month of the lockdown, businesses and business owners were in total disarray. You know, it was really, it was really, it, it, the shock was immense <laughs> for lots of business owners, you know. And so I just launched a free initiative. I began to hold weekly coaching, group coaching sessions for business owners. And I put it out there for free. And looking back, I'm glad I did it because by the time, you know, the government began to ease the lockdown towards the month of May and June, one of the uh, business owners who had been through the program said to me that, look, uh, you were the stabilizing, you know, you were the voice of stability for me in this time. You you helped me go through this sanely, you know, and so, I mean, that, that, was, that was huge for me. And so those are two things that, I mean, I could mention that did during the lockdown and, you know, uh, that was sort of impactful for me as a person. So what, what's your platform, man? Tell us about your platform. Where can we find it online? Uh, so you can check my most of the work I do. I put it on my Instagram page. Uh, my Instagram handle has all my work. I just keep updating my work there, uh, which is my name is Adebola Ajayi. My handle is Adebola underscore Ajayi. You can check that there. And then my website is www.debola.com. Com. It has my bio, my portfolio, and some of the work that we're, we're doing at the moment. But my Instagram page is almost always updated. Now, another thing we did was uh, a few days ago, I managed and coordinated and launched another initiative to the Red Cross of Nigeria, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I was on the field this time with the Red Cross, and um, we're able to go to their facilities. Uh, they, they have have a lot of people who are dependent on them, not just for health, not just for health needs, but also for um, accommodation, residential, and schooling needs as well. And so this particular Red Cross branch, they, they have 
have the hospital, they have the home for children, and they have the school for these children as well. And so they were also desperately in need for protective equipment to help them. So we just got out there on the field, myself and a few people, on the foundation that I also manage, it's called the Copy Foundation. And we went in there, you know, with um, Stalin Empire Initiative in partnership with Stalin Empire. We went in there with face masks, you know, and of course also with encouragement to just, um, because I also found out being on the field that encouraging words go a long way, you know, beyond the items that we donate, it's, it takes a toll when you are, you are working on the front line of this situation that so many people are in fear of. You know, so the demand on of courage and of you know bravery that 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 the COVID situation has put on people who are facing this head on is huge. And so they were really excited, you know, that we took out that time. We came to them, spoke with them, and donated some of these items to them. Right. But yeah, you, you can find all my work on my Instagram page. I, I always update stuff there, and on my website as well. Thank you. Great. Um, Guido, you have a very long history within the ecosystem. Within you started at a, you said it before 1996. You went for the first time. Um, what challenges stand out for you within the ecosystem? But not just before COVID, but also post COVID. What do you think is the big challenge at the moment? I was just going through statistics uh, today, um, and I think at the moment we have something like 680 tech hubs on the continent. So this number is growing significantly year by year. I remember like two, three years around uh, um, ago, we had something like 350, 380 tech hubs on the continent. So we have a massive growth in respect to this, uh, but what I also still see is a lot of fragmentation. So I think this is something which is truly holding back um, to really make... Um, to scale up the activities, to scale up technology, to scale up business, to scale up uh, relationships. So I think this is something that, that really has to come uh, come better along. It needs to be uh, empowered. Funding obviously is always a big topic. However, I'm, I'm getting more and more to a point where I'm saying, I think funding is actually not a problem. I think the startup uh, needs to get some seed Funding, but that's it. Uh, I would not recommend really to push a lot of um, money into a startup. I prefer to see that those startups get actually customers. So, and if a government wants to act somehow, or if a corporate wants to act somehow, then don't give them money. Give them a job. Give them a task to solve with the technology that they have that they want to develop, and give them some space actually to to really finalize that. Um, I liked actually to hear that you're doing a lot of mentoring. Uh, one, one experience that I had is um, that often people are interested into mentoring, but never really using it. So they say in the first place, yes, I would like to go for some mentoring, but then you don't hear back from them. And I experience this unfortunately yeah. often already. Um, and I think it could be such a massive empowerment uh, for a lot of startups, for a lot of entrepreneurs, if, because there's a lot of people out there who would like to mentor and who really would like to help, who have the business experience and let's say even more mature economies on the planet. And they really are willing to do this for free. And I think it, it should be more used. I don't see at the moment that it is really effectively used to a stage where it really makes a difference and it is really, let's say, bringing things forward. And then one of my key aspects is uh, what I'm thinking, you know, there is a lot of tech activities running on the continent at the moment by European, Chinese, American, Canadian, Israeli, corporates, incubators, accelerators, venture funds, etc. I don't see any African in Europe. Where are you guys? So when are there actually coming people here to really show off what they're doing. I mean, in Paris, you can go in the beginning of the year, uh, every year actually, uh, to the to the big tech conference. There is now a, a huge corner only on Africa, and the French people really pushing for it. The French administration pushes for it. Uh, Germany had a, a format running in the Ministry of Economics, which they called African Startup Night. It was running twice already. At the moment, everyone is waiting because they're trying to give space to African startup and entrepreneurs to show off what they're doing and to get interest generated. 
And I think it would be extremely necessary to do this more often. If I'm looking at seed stars, for instance, they're going on the African continent, they're going to Angola, they're going to South Africa, they're going to Ghana, etc. You know, but why are they not taking the Africans back to Europe or back to the US more often? They're doing it from time to time. I'm aware, I'm aware about this. But I think to really create this kind of visibility, it would be much more needed that also embassies, I had the pleasure to talk to the South African embassy about this three years ago, that really embassies also pushing for this. That they, they really bring in their own startups, which are successful operating with venture funds, which are successful operating in accelerators and getting international prizes into the key markets, also abroad, to really show this is Africa, we can do something. That is very true. We have um, we welcome our our viewers. Um, seeing a lot of people. Uh, Colin Madzimba from Zimbabwe is asking. I think the question is going towards both of you. Um, the question is, how do you know that this is the, the mentor you're seeing is a good one as a young entrepreneur? How can you be sure that the mentor you're you're staying with is good? So I, I think uh, Gurish should go, go for that. For I would, I would say, now let, no, let me. I think, first of all, thanks yeah. to the question from Zimbabwe. I mean, Zim is a wonderful country. I think there's a there's massive potential in that. Zimbabwe was the first country in Africa that I ever entered. So I have a lot of very positive memories and relationships to that country. Uh, to that country. Um, how do you how do you realize if a mentor is good or not? It always depends in, into which direction you want to go, and how how often you take the advice that the mentor is giving you. And if the advice is working out for you, for your business idea, for your entrepreneurial spirit, uh, then I think you have to have a good mentor. Uh, to be quite frank, I have never met a bad mentor, because normally mentoring is something that people are doing voluntarily. And someone who is not a good mentor is normally not doing this. So, uh, therefore, there's always something that you can get out. And the good thing is, if you have the feeling it's not enough what you get, get a second mentor or a third one, get a fourth one, get a fifth one. You know, there's a lot of people who are really interested in doing something like this and who really want to give back. So, take the opportunity. To take your chance. Great. Debola, what's your... Um, I think the, the in addition to what uh, Guido said, um, mentorship really is for acceleration, right? It is to help get you to a destination uh, as fast as safely possible without having to make the same mistakes that uh, the mentor that you are approaching necessarily made, you know? And so, I mean, and that already defines the essence of mentorship, which means that you, you, you ought to find somebody who, you ought to properly define the direction that you want to go and that you're going in, right? And once you have defined that, you know, you have that direction, then it's to find somebody who is, you know, who has done a bit more, who has more experience and more results in that field, and then to establish an effective relationship with that person to learn from person, right? Another thing I would say that makes mentorship, I think, unsuccessful for some people is they take the wrong approach, right? Um, most people who have the capacity to mentor another person can do so because of what they have experienced and the results they have gotten, right? That usually comes with a somewhat busy portfolio. Right, so uh, mentors usually what you need to bring your A game to the table, right? And like Guido said something earlier that you find people who want to learn but are just not going to come back, are not going to do anything with what they've learned, and I think that that's a major issue. So, uh, mentorship is not about wanting to affiliate with success or with a big name, it's about being willing to build. and so I feel like uh. If you come to that table with that approach, I am here to put in the work. I am here to get results. Yes. I am not here to waste your time as the mentor. 
and I'm not here to take advantage of you, right? I think that's also important. Uh, and I, I'm not here to use you. And I think another point that's very important is if you're going to establish a mentorship, mentor relationship, find some way you can add value, right? Uh, for me personally, I have little time and I have lots of people who send me messages and requests for mentorship <laughs> and for you know, some portion of my time or the other. And I found, you know, just I found that the people that I've been able to effectively work with over time are those who somehow in some way I am able to rely on, you know, so there is some sense of um, value trade in that relationship. You know, I think that's also important. So, um, I mean, nobody wants to engage a liability. So find a way to make yourself useful to your proposed mentor. And that usefulness can begin with being willing to put in the work. I think that's something that every mentor would appreciate. Be willing to put in the work to show up every day, irrespective and regardless of how you feel. Right? You need to show up and to prove to this mentor that this isn't a waste of time. And I, I, I believe that, that if you apply these few things, yeah, you, you can, you know, the mentor mentor relationship can be effective for you as a person. Definitely, definitely. I think uh, everyone who's been through or who has been a young entrepreneur and or even like working in an enterprise who has really had good mentors knows how or how to find the proper mentor for yourself. Uh, Guido, there's another question coming from, from our Facebook viewers. How can young people on the continent join the Space Initiative? There's different possibilities and I mean, I would first of all always recommend it, um, get in touch with your space organizations in your country. Um, most countries on the continent by now have one. It's first, it's one of the best access points you can get because they're always looking for people who get enthusiastic about the topic, who want to help to push it forward. Uh, the African continent has just founded uh, its own space uh, organization, which is located in Egypt. So you have in all major countries, um, space related organizations or even real space organizations. Additionally to this, just some research uh, in your particular country, because a lot of universities these days are also trying to get into this field, because it is also for engineering students uh, a very interesting activity. And besides this, you're always very welcome to get in touch with us so that we can assist and see uh, what we can do. Just, now uh, we're really trying to, to, to put some emphasis on this because until today, space startups are really under, underrepresented on the continent, unfortunately. But there's a lot of potential, a lot of chances existing because one thing which is ex extremely relevant is uh, a term which is called new space. And new space means at the end of the day, a global movement for the commercialization of space. So you have to know that so far in the last decades, space was dominated by institutional business. So, but institutions uh, lacking obviously, not just in times of Corona, uh, but also in general, funds and budgets to really go forward. And they want also to make some savings. And this is now a big chance since a while already. And there's uh, certain people like existing who are also building cars, who really have found this niche and realized that they can make significant amounts of money with offering commercialized space activities. And uh, in this regard, I can really always, uh, um, again, emphasize, look into what your idea is and push it forward. I just had a, a call in the beginning of the week uh, with a young gentleman from Nigeria who started his business with drones. He was looking in particular into agri-tech. And now mm -hmm. he's starting to developing spacecraft and uh, wants to see that he can offer services um, of autonomous um, uh, maneuvers in space by certain spacecraft. So I think that there, there is quite some momentum existing and uh, you just have to find the right entry point for this. And normally nationally is a good starting point and uh, afterwards, if it doesn't work, come to us, let us know. Uh, we're definitely going to help you with your uh, ideas. Yeah, my team was so nice and has already shared uh, Guido, your LinkedIn profile as well as his LinkedIn profile. So to our viewers, if you want to get to know more about our experts, please do not hesitate to reach out to them. Um, Debola, your main focus is on 
how can businesses have a social impact but also social uh, benefit from it uh this entire COVID time has been really crazy is there any company that has stood out during this time with a social impact but also making like um benefit from it mm, okay so uh firstly i believe that the business of well there's a way i say it that the business of social is the business of the future uh which is that businesses who sustain relevance over long periods of time are businesses who are truly committed to solving human problems you know in their various ways and sectors uh, technology one of the largest sectors in the world has been able to you know experience the, the growth in that it has globally across cultures across some um, ethnic lines across uh, language barriers because it truly helps to solve fundamental problems for us i mean we're able to do this you know have this conversation across countries because of technology so uh uh, businesses who are able in this, and I mean, the COVID period further re-emphasizes this, reinforces this, right? Its effect has spanned several different industries. And of course, one of the major industries it's affected is the workspace, the workplace, you know, the workforce, that corporate space. So people having to come into a physical building day on day to get their jobs done. Now the world in the last three months has been forced to consider something that has always been present something that has always been an you know an option for us for a few years now which is people working from home or people working remotely and covid has forced us to embrace that and we have seen that in some way it has you know um productivity has increased uh we have seen productivity increase we have seen people you know, pay more attention to their mental and emotional health as they have more time for their families and they have more time for to rest, they have more time to introspect, to think, and just basically more time for themselves while also getting their, you know, their jobs done, right? So again, like I said, I believe that companies who begin to do that innovative work of re-engineering their processes to really affect core human needs in all its various you know, spheres and industries, really are positioning themselves for long-term sustainability and viability, right? And of course, that in itself is a huge benefit. And, and, and for us in Africa, for us in well, Nigeria and Africa, we want to see more companies who, who have been in existence for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, transgenerational companies, right? We want to see a reduction in that statistic of 70% of all startups fail in the first five years. We want to see that statistic get better, right? And this is, I mean, because you might suffer certain setbacks in your process. You might suffer certain setbacks in your management. But if your business, if your service or your product is in continual and increased demand, the law of economics states that that, that in itself will force supply, right? And so when you position your product or your service to really be something that people need and require, you've positioned yourself for huge and tremendous benefit. Uh, in terms of companies that, you know, have i have watched you know in this period and that i've seen there's this company in nairobi called uh workshop 17 it's a co-working uh, well it used to be a co-working organization and I, I think that these um and you know the last two three years we saw a huge spike a huge rise in co-working organizations and co-working spaces and shared office spaces in Nigeria and in Africa. We saw a, a, a spike in that and in companies investing in that idea. And then COVID, of course, knocked that out so bad. But some organizations like Workshop 17 in Nairobi have pivoted and found a way to create a platform to take their, you know, their co-working workshop virtually, you know, online, and still making that service available to individuals and organizations that require it. Another organization is MEST Africa. MEST Africa is an innovation and incubation uh, sort of school. MEST also has been able to pivot, you know, uh, effectively taking their offerings, 
into that virtual space, you know, to ensure that that uh, uh, innovation is still available to consumers and to people who need it. So I believe that, I mean, right now, some there's the there's the conversation going on. Uh, um, those Ivy League schools, top tier schools, you know, taking their offerings online, will that dilute the brand offering that these schools possess, you know, as against having to come to the physical location like it's always been? But I believe that MEST is, you know, pioneering, is taking that step and encouraging everyone to come on board in that space. So, yeah, th th sure. these are a few things I could share on that question. Sorry, guys. Uh, the same question goes to you. What startups uh, you've been? You were like very much agreeing with with Devola on on the company from Nairobi. Is there any other startups that during the time stood up, and especially during COVID, stood up in like what you saw? Um, let's say I'm not, I'm not in particular aware of any startup that uh, stand out now because of COVID. I think that a lot of startups made an extra effort to see and to help and to give something back and support the community. Um, there's a couple mm -hmm. of startups that I really like on the continent, um, which really doing, let's say, things that no one would think of, in particular not in Europe um, or the US. Um, there's one startup, for instance, in Malawi, which is called Mama Bird. It's a, it's a, it's a little startup who's actually bringing um, uh, medical equipment to mothers who are in labor on the rural side. And they're using a drone for that just to ensure that the uh, mortality rate is going down. So I think this is something super extraordinary and um, I really like what the guys are doing. I know them well and uh, I think they, they, they may re they're really making an impact, right? So mm -hmm. then there is a, a company in Nigeria and um, which is called EVLL. Um, Not really anyone knows that the company is already existing since 2007, but I'm sure you know um, Bino and Fino. So Bino, 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 it's, a very, it's a very famous Nigerian uh, cartoon for kids. Yeah. Yeah. So th those, those guys operating since 2007 and they're making extremely good educational videos. They also, I think, did one on COVID-19, uh, which g went quite viral. So they're doing a lot in the this, in this STEM field, uh, on the STEAM field as well, uh, to show people the beauty of uh, technology, of engineering, and many, many other things, um, just for the kids. I really think it's extremely cool what they're doing. And maybe also um, me uh, mentioning another startup, which is called Simera Sense. Simera is a, is a company which was founded roughly, I would say, five to six years ago. They doing they started with equipment for satellites. By today, they're building their own satellites. It's a startup company from South Africa. They've even further developed. I think they have tripled their, their stuff, uh, have developed further um, spin-offs from the company. And very uh, they are very active in the space domain, as well as a very good ambassador for space activities that are coming from the African continent. So I think this is, this is giving a relatively broad portfolio. Uh, and before I'm forgetting it, I would like to mention LifeBank in Nigeria as well, because I think LifeBank is also making quite some difference with, with their activities in respect to um, all the medical um, destination related activities, as well as the, the, the blood transport via drones, because this is something which is also needed in particular in the north of the country. And it helps really to, to connect people in respect to their medical profile or in respect to their uh, me medical aspects to, to the doctors, to the, lab, uh, to the laboratories in the cities, and then also gives, give them back some results. So um, there is some extraordinary uh, startups on the continent, which not just in COVID-19 are of high relevance and who really helping and making a difference, but also even without this unfortunate pandemic that we're all facing at the moment. Great. That's, Great. That's very true. Um, Debola, what do you envisage within the African startup ecosystem 
post COVID. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, uh, so I, I like to say that uh, when we say post COVID, uh, post COVID, we, we all hope that a vaccine is found to deal with the novel coronavirus. But as it were right now, uh, post COVID might mean finding ways to exist innovatively and effectively within the new challenge that we face as mankind. Uh, Post-COVID might not be that the coronavirus has been dealt with and we can all come out and play like before. Um, this isn't the first, well, it's severe. I'm not up to 100 now, but in the last 100 years that the entire world was shut down by a virus. You know, but I believe in the resilient nature of mankind and in our ability to adapt. And I think that in terms of thinking post-COVID, you know, the key word there should be adaptation for every business entity and organization that it is time to adapt, it is time to innovate, and it is time to find ways to maintain efficiency within the current realities that we find ourselves. I believe the world will adjust as the months go by. You know, we will have contractions and expansions. Uh, if a couple of days ago, I think it was San Francisco now, I can't remember the city in the US that was shut down all over again. You know, they, lock, they back into a new phase of lockdown as a result of a spike in cases. So we're going to experience that. We're going to experience expansions and contractions in the situation as more time goes on. And so we must brace up and embrace adaptation, right? Adaptation really must be what's on our mind when we think post-COVID. Um, of course, all industries have been hit, but I think we will see, of, uh, we will see uh, the greatest responses from one, the health industry, of course, as a result of the fact that it's on the front line of this particular unique situation. So we're going to see that industry, as we have seen already, hugely impacted. And we're going to see a lot of reforms coming out of that sector. I can't remember the country now. I think it's France that just put out a new bill as to a certain amount of money that all health workers will now should now be paid in the country. So we're going to see more of things like this coming up as France, as just came out in France a few days ago, right? Again, in that corporate workspace, in that work labor force industry, uh, we see that that industry has been hugely affected. And just like we, we saw the, the stock prices of Zoom skyrocket, and we saw the stock prices of Microsoft Teams, you know, uh, the virtual platforms that enabled us to remain effective, remain connected, I mean, we saw the stock price of Netflix skyrocket. And interestingly, we saw the stock price of Amazon skyrocket as well. And so even though, I mean, Amazon is a very good example. Even though Amazon is that retail space, you know, employing that offer aggregation business model, as a result of the fact that Amazon had the engine, you know, the, the muscle within its process to connect and to bring the goods and services that people need from one place to another, we saw their value exponentially increase. And so we will see some industries struggle and we will see some industries rise. All around, as time goes on, we will see some industries will take giant steps in adaptation and innovation while some industries will take baby steps, you know, in adaptation and innovation. But I believe that by all means, we as mankind will keep finding ways to move and forge ahead. Um, in the beauty industry in Nigeria, for example, prior to COVID, uh, the beauty industry was limited. The application of the beauty industry, you know, ladies having to get their hair done, their nails done, men having to get a haircut or a shave uh, within you know um, um, retail spaces, retail outlets. Recently, I saw news in Nigeria, a beauty company that whose innovation is to take their beauty, uh, 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 their beauty business into trucks. You know, it's just like the ice cream truck idea, right? So now we have 
uh, a, a, a moving beauty salon, right? That will drive to your neighborhood. And of course, they are all in the PP equipment and all that well sanitized. And you can just walk out of your house. So it's becoming a neighborhood by neighborhood, you know, sort of like garbage pickup. That's the innovation that this beauty uh, company has put in place for the existence and survival of their business. When I saw that, that was really interesting for me because the beauty industry has never done that before. We've, I've never seen a moving salon. We, no, yeah. <laughs> that particular innovation and adaptation ha hadn't been brought to the beauty industry before now. But so people are waking up. People are seeing possibilities. Uh, people are seeing, because it's innovate or die. That's always been the the, 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 the the name of the game. Same thing that happened with um, when the digital camera was produced, how Kodak went out of business you know, many, many years ago. It's the reality we all face now. So everybody, it's adapt. So when you think post-COVID, think adaptation, right? Because as a business person, you must, you must maintain your thought process to be practical, to be efficient, to be result-oriented. So don't, don't get locked up. Don't sit down somewhere. And for you post-COVID is you're waiting for the world to resume the way it was, you know, uh, prior to four months ago, prior to five months ago, prior to three months ago. Innovate. And interesting thing is some of these innovations, even if a vaccine is found tomorrow, they remain relevant. They remain effective business strategies that can, you know, continue to be employed. Because now you can and you can deploy systems that helps you to multiply your your results as a business or as a company. So for me, post COVID is adaptation. Post COVID is innovation. Just mankind into more and more of that across industries and sectors. Thank you very much, Devola. With all of you. Uh, Verena Renfro from Chocolate Angel. Guido, I guess you met her before. Uh, she's sending us greetings from uh, Helsinki. And uh, she's also agreeing, agreeing with Debola very much that we have to. Uh, Samuel Boachi from Ghana is sending his regards and says that he loves the conversation and the energy. Uh, regarding startup that you said from Malawi, you know. Um, which project are they implementing their startup? You know that. Can you repeat? Yeah, can you repeat? I, I didn't get that. The... We were asking which district is Mama Bird Malawi implementing their startup oh that's a very good question honestly i have no idea but i can I can tell you go on google put in mama bird you end up on their home page directly contact them tell them i told you that you must uh, them, that they must give you some infos and insights and they will do that with pleasure don't worry they're really cool guys but i really don't know the district i'm super sorry That's, um, thank you very much, though. Um, Guido, you have a lot of experience in this, within the startup ecosystem. What do you think that needs to be done to empower the startups? And what more do African startups need to attract funds? We said before, not only funds are important, but how can startups attract funds? First, first of all, I think there is more collaboration needed. I mean, if you if you are a startup and you're somewhere in the north of Kenya, um, people are not really seeing you. It's the same. I was just coming across now uh, accelerator in Somalia. I'm not sure that people are really seeing you. So I think it is extremely necessary to beat the drum. You really have to show that you exist. You really have to come up, uh, be present, um, show your strengths. And in particular, what is your concept? What is your product? I think it is, it is yes, it is a question of, of money as well, you know, to, to, to travel to some of the hubs like Nairobi or Lagos, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Accra. But 
I met a startup, I think three or four years ago. Those guys had no money. So what they did actually, they worked to build up their startup by getting a bus ticket. So they were doing little jobs to get a bus ticket just to drive down to mm -hmm. Nairobi to go actually into MEST and to interact and exchange with the people. You have to get access to such a hub. You know, if you're in, in somewhere, it doesn't really work. In Europe, it is at the moment changing a little bit. That's a very interesting trend uh, because we had those hotspots, you know, we had, or we still have. We have London, we have Berlin, we got Paris, we get Amsterdam and a couple of other country, uh, state, um, cities in the States. But now all of a sudden, people are realizing that, uh, no, the investor, if the investor wants something from me, it's very interesting. <laughs> If the investor wants something from me, he has to come on the countryside. Because I, I'm a startup, I can't pay any more than high rents in the city. You know, I can't pay for the, for the fiber connections over there. And my business, in any case, I developed here in my garage. So, but they're making very good homepages, super good uh, advertisement and marketing for themselves to really show that's who we are. If you want to get in touch, we will be super proud, super happy. Um, and you're very welcome. We were going to offer you a coffee and uh, some some sweets. Maybe even the ice truck is coming by. So um, this is this is a little bit of a development. But for for Africa, at the moment, at that point in time, I think it's a super idea. Find, find ways to get into the hubs, get into accelerators or incubators where you get really access to those networks. Yes, it is a hassle sometimes to apply and to go through all the processes, going through the gates, making the presentations. And at the end of the day, it is paying off. Because even if you're not, let's say, winning the big prize at the end of the day, you're meeting a lot of people, you're meeting a lot of experiences. And in particular, you extremely extending your network. And I think this is super important to really be successful in future and now. Um. I think this is a very, uh, um, and I find it, we are unfortunate, any last words that I think, Guido, your words were very, very um, impact and having like the, the right message giving out, any last words to our viewers um, for today, from any of the two of you? Let me start uh, because yeah, then so, I can give it to my uh, African African partner because I think you should have the last word in any case. So for me, there's only one thing that I want to see, guys. And all of you have to work on this, you know? Everyone who were, who were seeing Black Panther knows Wakanda. So what really has to come up in future is that companies, global companies, global players, not going to California, not going to Shenzhen and China, not going to London, or to some other places in Japan, to Tokyo or Kyoto, for their R&T labs. No, 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 they have to go to Nairobi. They have to go to Johannesburg, to Accra, to Lagos, and all the other places that are really making a difference. They are where the real business of tomorrow is developed. And this is something that I would like to see. That would, have, would, would be my last words in this regard. Words from you? Uh, yeah, so for me, um, my last words will be that uh, for us as Africans, uh, Africa is our continent. Uh, this, is, this is where our origin is and resides. And the interesting thing I found about the world or about life is that laws are unique. Vassal. Uh, very simply, the law of gravity in Africa is the same, has the same effect application in Europe. It has it in Asia, in the United States, in North America, in South America. The law of gravity is one and the same. And so for every entrepreneur out 
they are building a startup. My word to you is this. The law of solving a problem is universal. Value is traded where a problem is solved. You put your mind in. Uh, the entrepreneurial journey at the beginning will be lonely, right? And it can be filled with a lot of challenges. But do not come to that startup table expecting to be for things to be handed out to you. And do not base your drive on what another organization or another person will make or not make available to you. Let your drive and your passion be focused on and also be an expression of the fact that you have found a problem to solve, right? So convert, convert your passion, convert your, 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 your ability to do something as a person to a problem you are solving either for an individual or for an organization. I believe that mm -hmm. this is an effective place to start. At. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world, value will always come to he or she who is solving a problem. So for me, that's the first thing, right? When you're able to effectively do that, you have built something, a product or a service that is solving a problem, right? And you've been able to put a structure and process around that uh, to maintain what you are, your, what we call it your value proposition, which is to maintain your promise to your customer, to your buyer. Once you've been able to put your structure and process around being able to maintain your promise to your buyer, the next thing you should look at is your narrative. Amplification, mm -hmm. amplification, amplification. Do not be shy or quiet about your work. Uh, do not leave the do not leave the application of your work to other people, right? Be proud of what you do. Be bold about it. Be your number one, uh, what's that word now? Your number one fan. And you determine what your narrative is. Do not let other people, I believe that one of the major mistakes we've made in Africa is we have let the rest of the world define our narrative. Continent with challenges. <laughs> there are challenges in every continent, uh, uh, several challenges, but some continents have been able to develop systems and structures to guarantee the narrative that they are projecting to the rest of the world, right? Um, and so, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement that broke out in the last one, two months and became a worldwide movement is a situation that had always been there. It, it, was, it, 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 it was not a recent situation, right? Uh, the issue of, uh, of, of, you know, the oppression of, the, of, of colored people and their lack of access to opportunity has always been there. But certain events brought it to the fore and the rest of the world came onto, you know, that message. And so, uh, but the narrative, that many of us in other parts of the world have about the US, the United States, is that it is the land of the free and the home of the brave, right? That's the narrative with every article, with every movie, you know, with, with they have, they, they're a nation who have mastered their single story and they have sold that story to the rest of the world. And then you have such a massive influx of immigrants to the United States. But then we have this situation of Black Lives Matter. And so you wonder, how, how, do, you, how do you balance this? The narrative of the land of the free as against you know, this serious issue of racism and inequality. So push your story. Narrative is important. Be loud about it. Like I said, once you have mastered your product and your service, you have built your structure and process to guarantee that you can continually meet your promise to your market, to your customer, to your audience. Go all out in amplifying and, you know, making, we call it making noise about your message. And as you consistently do that, the right partnerships will come your way. 
uh, the right opportunities will come your way. There are organizations and individuals all over the world who are looking for individuals and organizations to invest in, to partner with, to collaborate with, because collaboration is a universal law of multiplication. And this is known all over the world, mm -hmm. right? And so once you're able to consistently, you know, stay on that lane, stay on your story, you will find the right opportunities and the right collaborations, right? So th those will be my final words. Thank you very much. Guido, it was a pleasure. Debola, it was a pleasure having both of you here. Um, thank you very much for thank taking you. the time. Thank you very much for being here. And let's make the future now and have a bigger impact. Thank you to our viewers and have a good evening. Thanks, Joe.